The exciting thing about leaving Great Yarmouth is that I get to sail around the most easterly bit of land in the UK. I am literally turning a corner. Well, okay, a long gentle bend then. While most of this part of the east coast is eroding at up to a yard a year and retreating inwards, a whole string of freaky coincidences involving the physics of sand, water and meteorology mean that the Ness is growing out. It has put on 300 yards since the 1930s and is also slowly moving south, although apparently it's recently started moving north, which coincides with the sand dredging operations just a few miles offshore of here. Time to take the broads sticker down. Beautiful day, making pretty good progress. Okay, 2.8 knots, it's not very good progress, but the tide is against us. About an hour and a half, two hours time it'll change, and then it'll be with us. So we'll be doing four knots, six, six knots. And this says that it's 18 miles to Cromer. Here's a confession. I seldom get nervous when sailing, but something rather odd happens when you spend a few weeks tucked away up a wonderfully safe area such as the Broads. It's a place where you're seldom more than a few yards away from a grassy bank and a safe mooring post or two. The thought of tides and rivers can become almost frightening. The fear only lasts a few minutes and fairly soon I'm back into trusting the boat to stay upright and move to the rhythm of the sea. Then I start working out how to use or even cheat the tide. Within minutes, I'm once more a sea sailor. After the Ness comes Caster, which is eroding almost as fast as the Ness is growing. I'm just hugging the coast. Um, when I'm close to shore, about five feet, then I'm traveling at three and a bit knots. But when I'm 14 feet, which is not that far offshore, then I'm traveling at two and a half knots. So it pays me to hand steer. Of course, I could just schlep out to sea, engage the tiller pilot and disengage my brain. An understanding and curiosity about the way the land is formed is a great thing in any sailor. As I work north, the signs of the massive erosion are evident all along the Norfolk coast between Lower Stoft and Cromer, as the North Sea eats away at the old sand dune systems that were built in the last ice age. The sun has come out and the sea's gone blue. The wind started moving in the right direction. So we decided to go slowly and quietly rather than noisily. The endless supply of ancient sand that last saw daylight when sabre-toothed tigers, mammoths and Neanderthals roam the area means that the beaches are lovely and the rainfall is down around the low 20s. Hence the massive caravan sites all along here. From Google Earth you can see their tidy, well-organised ranks of satisfying homogeneity. At sea Pauling they built these weird breakwater things that really work. At neat tides and with an offshore wind, sailors can duck behind these breakwaters, drop a hook and take a rest. But not for me. The beast powers us on. I've got tidal gates to hit. This is sea pelling and they these rocks in. 
in kind of Y shapes um, to try and protect the beach. Presumably it's working. A lot of work. And I wonder where the rocks come from. I know there's a quarry in Scotland which uh, people are upset about it. Basically they're demolishing an island. Well, maybe that's what we'll be doing in the future. Demolishing islands in order to protect the mainland. In places, the sea is clearly winning. Haysborough, or as it's spelt, Happisburg, the cliffs are retreating at a yard a year. This coast has miles to retreat before the sea will encounter anything like serious resistance. You can see the odd place where steps have been taken to protect the coastline, but generally it's left to nature to take its course. Houses and caravan plots with wonderful sea views are doomed to drop into the sea. Travelling along about four feet of water uh, and the boat's doing four knots but we're only doing two knots through the water so I'm plugging two knots aside. Of course, when it turns, it'll be in my favour, so that'll be marvellous. But right now, right here. You can see, today is not relentless sunshine. Looks as though there's a bit of a squall coming my way, which is a shame. There you go. Wow. Oh. <laughs> uh, I've got my work here on again. It's doing it again. Bloody weather. Pissing down with rain. Fortunately, it's going to pass soon. I hope. Yuck. How can it go from lovely to this in no time at all?
Then, further up, the land starts to rise. The biggest town along here by far is Chroma, built on a sand hill and protected by ever more elaborate concrete defences. But no matter how elaborate the sea defence is, all they can ever buy is time, because the waves will always win. Chroma has a brilliant church. It's made of hand-cut flints. Can you imagine the amount of time involved in getting them to the right shape? The dastardly Hun bombed the towns all along this coast, although if you read the history books it seems as though the only people who ever suffered air raids were the chippy cockneys and toffs in London. Here in Cromer the bombs blew every bit of glass out of the windows in the west side of the church. The result is that in the afternoon the interior is bathed in lead glass filtered sunlight. It looks absolutely wonderful. In the summer, the neat little streets of the town crawl with tourists. But down on the front, near the pier, the crab fishermen carry on with the business of seeding the shore with their propeller ensnaring crustacean catching aquatic paraphernalia. Lined up along the seawall are the tractors they use for launching and recovering the boats. They all seem to think that they need to own their own tractor. Typical of fishermen, that is. Independent-minded blokes, self-reliant and uncooperative bar stewards to a man. Very slow for him, that is. They do an amazing job of launching and recovering boats from this beach, though. And it's a truly awful place to base a boat, if you ask me. at this stage that I managed to ground the slug on some sort of obstruction close to the pier and also managed to catch the prop on a partially submerged crab pot line. The camera wasn't running but these navigational mishaps would cost me dear in the coming weeks. 